I think that concludes our introduction of guests. So it is now time for oral questions. And I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to uh, the Premier. The Ford government has repeatedly claimed that no Ontarian will have to pay out of pocket for essential health services and that OHIP coverage will be there for people with serious medical needs. Does the Premier stand by this uh, commitment? The question is to the Premier. Minister of Health. Referred to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Will be there to cover essential medical needs, but of course you understand that what we inherited from the previous government—a $15 billion deficit—we are here to protect what matters most. We have undertaken a line-by-line -line review of everything in our government, and we are focusing on the things that matter most to people, the things that are going to provide the best value to people. And we need to modernize our our health system to make sure that it responds to the needs of people now and into the future. That's what we're concentrating on. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, Alison Knudsen and John Laundreville are joining us today in the legislature. They're in the uh, uh, opposition gallery. They both live with kidney failure and need regular dialysis treatments to stay healthy. On October 1st, the Premier is planning to eliminate out of country health care coverage from OHIP, which will include coverage for dialysis. People like Allison and John can't get private travel insurance for dialysis treatments because insurance companies will not provide that coverage. So they will not be able to get private insurance. Does the Premier feel they should never be allowed to leave the province or that they should go in debt to do so? Mr. Bell. Thank you, Speaker. The Out of Country Travelers Program spends a third of its funding on administration alone and has not historically provided Ontarians with meaningful travel coverage. That also said people have been led to believe that they have greater coverage than they actually do, and I think it's important to tell Ontarians the truth so that they can provide for their own coverage when they're out of country. Now, that said, I understand that there are certain people we've discovered through our consultations, people that are on dialysis who have difficulty obtaining private coverage. We look forward to working with you and with your guests today to, to work that out to make sure that they are able to travel and they are able to receive the coverage. Stop the clock. Order. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. Speaker, this is exactly what happens when you cut before you consult. Exactly the kind of problem that this government is creating all across our province. And I can guarantee the Premier of this province uh, that the thing that matters lower. the most to Allison and to John is their health and their ability to get dialysis and live the kind of life that they want to live. Ontarians who need these life-saving saving treatments deserve the same opportunities as everyone else. That's why our public health care system is supposed to provide exactly that. With these cuts to OHIP, the Premier is effectively blocking people like Allison and John from having the province, uh, to, uh, leaving rather, the province to visit their families, to go to school, and to advance their careers. Will the Premier listen to Allison, John, and those living with kidney failure across Ontario and reverse their reckless cuts to health care. Minister of Health, respond. Thank you. Speaker, through you, I would say to the Leader of the Official Opposition that, again, a third of the expenses that related to the Out of Country Travellers program were being spent on administration. That is not providing good value to Ontario taxpayers. We want to make sure that we put the money directly into frontline services, but we do understand that there may be special circumstances, people who are on dialysis programs that find it very difficult to obtain private coverage. We want to work with them to make sure they can receive the coverage they need so that they are able to travel. But we would also urge all Ontarians to take a look when they are traveling to please purchase private insurance for most people it is not expensive and is easily obtained but there are special circumstances and we look forward to working with you to resolve those issues the next question once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, my next question is to the Premier, but I think the Minister of Health just acknowledged that people are going to have to pay out of pocket for health care, which is something that the people of Ontario don't want. They don't want to have 
have to pay out of pocket for health care because only the people who can afford it will be able to do so. Speaker. Today's Toronto Star reveals disturbing details of internal documents warning the Ford government that their plans for government side budget order. cuts would, and I quote, put families at higher risk of going into crises and, quote, put a uh, pose a danger to life for children and youth at risk or in need of protection, end quote. Did the Premier read that document, Speaker, and if so, why did he cut a billion dollars from children, community and social services? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Once again, I reject the premise of the Leader of the Official Opposition's question. She knows full well that a billion dollars was not taken from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. In fact, the budget this year has increased by almost $300 million. We've made historic investments in combating violence against women. We have doubled the funding for autism services in the province of Ontario to over $600 million. But we were elected to get this province back on track after 15 years of reckless spending, waste and mismanagement so that we could protect what matters most, and that is for children and youth, community and social services, poverty reduction, immigrants, newcomers, veterans. That's who we're standing up for, Speaker, and that is why we considered a number of different options that were provided to us and why we rejected Response. those that hurt the most vulnerable. This is a government that will continue to protect what matters most, and I will have no part of listening to the fear-mongering of the member opposite. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Well, the government can spin all they want, Speaker, but the estimates are clear and the budget was clear. In last month's budget, the government ignored warnings and made very deep cuts to Ontario's most vulnerable people, and they've made it clear that there are more cuts on the way. How much more pain, how much more suffering, Speaker, can families in need expect from this Premier and his government? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Speaker, again, the leader of the official opposition is going down this path of fear-mongering, scaring people, Shame, and okay. trying to rile up Ontario's most vulnerable people. We were elected with a mandate to protect what matters most. We left no stone unturned. We looked at all of the options. We rejected most of those options. But, Speaker, this is what this ministry has done. Uh, uh, since taking office, we have brought in a 1.5 per cent increase in social assistance right across the board. This is a government that invested in historic $107.5 million dollars to combat violence against women. Our investment into autism services in the province of Ontario are well over $600 million. And Speaker, we're doing that because we recognize our health care system, our education system, and our social service system are what people rely on right across this province. But if the member Spons? opposite wants to engage in rhetoric, reckless rhetoric, she can continue to do that, but at every turn she better run, understand one thing. I will call her out and I will make sure that the reckless is Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I would respectfully submit that it is, it is the government of Ontario, the Conservative government, that has already instilled fear in the, the people in our province who are the most vulnerable. And it is their reckless cuts that have done so, Speaker. It is clear now exactly where the Ford government wants to take this province and the people of Ontario, especially the most vulnerable. Those people are the ones that are going to pay the highest price. This government has been warned that their cuts will put people's lives at risk, including children's lives, devastate families, and will result in increased costs in health care, increased costs in policing, increased costs in corrections, just to name a few, Speaker. When will this Premier stop bellowing and start listening? Minister. And the member opposite engages in, in baseless rhetoric. She understands full well from the article that that was a draft document that was circulated in November, a full uh, several months before the budget was tabled on April 11th, which is the fiscal plan moving forward, which is what is protecting what matters most within the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, with historic investments into, uh, in, into autism services, investing in children's treatment centres, ensuring that we can in, uh, have a sustainable social assistance program with a ministerial Opposition come to order. throughout the rest of government. But let me be perfectly clear. She can talk about a draft 
unsigned document all she wants. I'll talk about our budget, which was tabled on April the 11th, and the estimates where I look forward to actually engaging with the members opposite on what the truth is about the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services and this government for the people. Next question, once again. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is to the Premier, but I can assure the government that a billion dollars cut from children, community and social services is nothing draft about it. It is real and it is hurting people today. For over a week now, government side the come Hospital, order. Health Sciences North has been struggling with a serious overcrowding situation. Last weekend, the hospital cancelled six sur surgeries and took the step of warning the public to expect longer than normal wait times and to receive care in hallways, closets and bathrooms. They now say that they're on the verge of uh, declaring something called a code orange. A code orange is usually called to deal with community disasters, such as large-scale accidents and occurrences with mass casualties. But the only large-scale disaster that's hitting Sudbury is the Ford government's disastrous health cuts. Can the Premier tell us why he's making hallway medicine worse instead of better? Question is to the Premier. Minister of Health. Referred to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Certainly aware that Health Sciences North has faced financial problems over the last several years and that they are working through it with the Ministry of Health officials. We are provided frequent reports about what's going on, but I think it is important to note that we are working on the front lines of health care and are investing an extra $384 million for Ontario's hospitals for next year. We're certainly aware that many of Ontario's hospitals are over capacity right now, that they are struggling with placing people in hallways and storage rooms and other inappropriate places. We promised the people of Ontario that we would end hallway health care. We are putting that money into hospital operations this year, yep. which should help to ease many of the situations Ontario hospitals are facing, including Response. Health North. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, the government's hospital funding barely keeps pace with inflation, much less growing. Uh, much, much less the growing needs of a, of a growing and aging population. But that's matched with funding cuts to e-health, to public health, and to health research, all of which means less coordination, less disease prevention, and more patients heading to emergency rooms already struggling with hallway medicine. That's what this government is bringing to Ontarians. The Ford government promised investments to handle hallway medicine, but families are seeing nothing but cuts, cuts, and more cuts, hospitals in crisis, frontline workers getting layoff notices, and more Ontarians in hallways. Why? Is this what the government is offering Ontarians when they promise so much, much more? more? Minister. Thank you. Through you, Speaker, I think I need to remind the Leader of the Opposition what we inherited last June. $15 billion deficit that we have to work through. We have to make choices. We went line by line. All of us went line by line through our various budgets, and we are committed to protecting what matters most, health care and education. And in fact, in our budget, we committed to spending $1.2 billion more in public health care. That is to help ease hallway health care, to help provoke, promote mental health and addictions plan, to modernize our health care system that we've spoken about many times here in the legislature, to make sure that we can respond to the needs of people now and into the future. We are bringing forward digital health. We are bringing forward a mental health and addictions plan. We are supporting hospitals. We are supporting frontline care. That's what people care about. That's what we committed to doing. We are being responsible stewards of public money and that is what we're going to make sure that we do for the people of Ontario because that's what's Response. most Land. important to Great them. Land. Order. Next question, the member from Mississauga Centre. Center. 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 Mr. Speaker, this question is for the Premier. Fifteen years of Liberal governance in our province has made life harder for Ontarians. Mm -hmm. the, cost of the cost of skyrocketing um, hydro rates under a government that refused to listen to the people. The former Liberal government led Ontario down an unsustainable path. Endless taxes, unprecedented hydro rates burdened hardworking families and are most vulnerable. Ontario voted for change last year. Our PC government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, is bringing relief to the province while restoring accountability and trust in our elected officials. Speaker, can the Premier please highlight the policies our government has introduced to provide relief for the people of Ontario? 
Thank you to the member for Etobicoke Centre. The question is to the Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank our all-star MPP from Etobicoke Centre, absolute champion. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, after spending numerous years, actually decades, creating jobs here in Canada, creating jobs in the U.S., I understand what it takes to create jobs. We're making this atmosphere a lot easier for job creators to put money back into their business, to invest in equipment, to invest in people, to get the province going. Mr. Speaker, under the previous government, under the Liberals, we saw 300,000 jobs exit this province with the help of the NDP. They voted with the NDP and the Liberals 98 per cent of the time. They were connected at the hip. They destroyed this province, jacked up hydro Spots. rates. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? We're turning the province around. Just last month alone, we created 30,000 jobs for young people in a total of 175. Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Thank you. Thank you. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What's absolutely clear is that this is a government that is for the people. We have committed to making life more affordable today and for years to come. While the federal government continues to make life more expensive through their senseless carbon tax, our government remains steadfast in delivering on our prop promises to the people of Ontario. We are standing up for seniors, students, frontline workers, and everyone in between. Our accomplishments so far demonstrate that. Could the Premier please tell us more about this government and how he is standing up for the people of this province? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the MPP from Etobicoke Centre for her, her question. But as I was saying, Mr. Speaker, just last month alone, in April, we created 30,000 jobs for young people, 47,000 in total in April. A total, this is unprecedented in Ontario. In 10 months, we created 170,000 jobs. 170,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. And it sure wasn't from the help of the NDP that get up there and all they want to do is raise taxes, tax the people to death. They're constantly having their hands in their pockets, along with their buddies, the Liberals. It's all about tax and spend with the opposition. We took a different approach. We got elected to straighten out a fiscal just disaster. We, we inherited a bankrupt. We inherited a bankrupt province, Mr. Speaker. We inherited $15 billion deficit, the largest sub-sovereign debt in the entire world, created by them. They destroyed the province. We're turning it around. Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the member for Brantford Brant took to Twitter, apparently shocked and confused by stories of cancelled courses at schools in his riding. And he pleaded with constituents to tell him if they have had courses cancelled so he could, quote, see what's going on. Speaker, I can help explain what's going on. The Grand Erie District School Board has already told 21 elementary teachers and 84 second teachers, they won't have jobs this fall. Students in every community will be directly impacted, no matter which side of this House their MPP sits on. So far, the Premier has refused to take responsibility for these painful cuts. Mr. Speaker, will he listen to his own members? Questions to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, first of all, the MPP from Brantford is an absolute champion. I've been out there. The people love him. He's created thousands of jobs in his riding. He's listening to the people. He was, he, he was, he's instrumental in turning this province around. He's a true leader in our caucus. But, Mr. Speaker, I just want to remind uh, the opposition, uh, we, we, we increased education by $700 million, Mr. Speaker. You know, they, it's simple. Anyone can figure 2 plus 2 out. Maybe the opposition can't figure out what 2 plus opposition 2 is. Come to we order. created. We're creating more spots for education, putting money back into the classroom. It's very simple. You add up the teachers, and, and all the teachers in the province is, is, is roughly 200,000 of them. Guess how many students there are? There's 2 million. Do the math, Mr. Speaker. Response. That's one in 10. One in 10. 
We're putting money back into the classrooms. Not all the layers of bureaucracy. Not all the school boards that sit there. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think the Premier needs to go back and learn how to read a budget because we are seeing the impact of these devastating cuts in our classrooms today, and it's only getting worse. Every single day. Government the side come to order. Impact of these cuts. I apologize to the member for Davenport for having to introduce or to interrupt her. I ask the government members once again to come to order. Start the clock. Member for Davenport. I appreciate that it's difficult news for the government, but every day the devastating impact of these cuts is more apparent. And every day, this Premier and his Minister of Education deny and deflect and delay. Well, next week, as members opposite head back to their ridings, they'll have to answer to their own constituents about why they want to shortchange our kids. Cutting courses, cutting supports, reducing one-on-one -on -one time with teachers. Will the Premier use next week to rethink this disastrous plan and come back with one that will strengthen our public education system and put Students first. Premier. You know, the, the member in the opposition that keeps saying cuts, what cuts? They can't name any because there hasn't been any, exactly. Mr. Speaker. We've increased $700 million. I'm going to send them to a math class, each and every one of them, because they can't add. It's $700 million we're putting back into education. But that's not it, Mr. Speaker. We're putting $1.6 billion more in order. education, protecting every teacher's job. I can't wait till September so all the rhetoric and nonsense that we've heard from opposition, all the rhetoric, rhetoric we've heard from the teachers' unions that don't have the opposition teachers' best interests. You know, Mr. Speaker, in September, we're going to say, we told you so. There wasn't any cuts. We're putting more money in education, more money into the classroom. That's what it's about. And we're in this shape because they spent $15 billion. House will come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. question is for the minister who builds up success, the Minister of Infrastructure. Last week, <laughs> they, last week I was in Red Rock for an exciting announcement that our government for the people marked the start of a new Red Rock wastewater treatment plant. Water quality, as you know, is fundamental to healthy and sustainable communities. This new investment supports quality infrastructure that people need. Red Rock's new water treatment facility will keep citizens healthy, protect the environment, and allow more people to enjoy Nipigon Bay. This critical project is especially important because Nipigon Bay is identified as an area of concern under the Canada-US Great Lakes Water Treatment Agreement. Can the minister please tell us about this great project and how this investment will not just grow the economy but help the environment? Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Barrie Innisfil for that excellent question. Mr. Speaker, the new wastewater treatment project in Red Rock uh, that the parliamentary assistant announced on behalf of our government will benefit people and the environment. Our government is contributing two-thirds of the total cost of this project, Mr. Speaker, more than $17 million. This plant will improve water quality in the region to ensure economic prosperity uh, for area residents and protect waterways and fish habitats. Mr. Speaker, infrastructure truly matters. With this critical investment, we are ensuring quality water for the community while following through on our environmental commitment through our Made in Ontario environmental plan. This is just yet another way we're highlighting our commitment to helping the environment without the need of Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, with the right infrastructure investments, we're protecting what matters most and putting people at the centre of everything that we do. Supplementary question. 
Thank you for that uh, wonderful answer, uh, uh, Minister. And my follow-up question, Mr. Speaker, is, is to see the encouraging benefits of this, this project that will bring benefits to the members of Red Rock and to Nipigon Bay. And it's another example of how our Made in Ontario plan for the environment is working. And it's an environment plan, Mr. Speaker. It's not a tax plan that will not only help our environment, protect yes, our economy, and enable economic development in places like Thunder Bay, Red Rock, and on and Nipigon Bay. Uh, and as you've seen, after 15 years of fiscal mismanagement by the NDP Liberal Coalition, it left many vulnerable communities, vulnerable communities uh, in a state where they need a lot of help. But there's hope, Mr. Speaker, hope again that our government is now keeping our promise to bring the province back on track for fiscal responsibility. So my follow-up question to the minister is, can you tell this House why it's so important to protect what matters most and to balance the books in Ontario here, here. to bring us back to prosperity? Minister. Thank you again uh, to the member for that uh, great question. Mr. Speaker, I couldn't agree more. Uh, putting this province back on track means getting our fiscal house in order. We are turning this province around. We're building smart infrastructure investments at the right time and in the right place. Ontario's 2019 budget lays out a comprehensive five-year path to balance while protecting what matters most to the people of this province. This $17 million investment means economic development in the region, making it attractive for businesses and good jobs. It's the right investment that will directly improve water quality on Nipigon Bay. Mr. Speaker, Northern Ontario is truly now open for jobs. We're helping communities with their critical infrastructure needs, fulfilling our commitment to helping the environment, all while creating jobs, helping families, and protecting what matters most. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. On March 26, the uh, Peel District School Board sent a letter to the Minister of Education outlining serious concerns with this government's cuts to education. Because the Minister failed to respond yesterday, the School Board actually sent another letter highlighting the impact the uh, government's cuts and larger class sizes will have on students in Brampton and the Peel region. So I can appreciate that the minister maybe gets a lot of emails, so I'm happy if a page is willing to come over to send this uh, letter over to the minister so that she can review it. And there's a copy here for the premier as well. Um, you know, in this letter, they warn uh, that schools will be left uh, with limited or no elective courses, and some uh, which will have, and I quote, significant negative impacts on some subject areas, Mr. Speaker. So does the Premier believe that cutting all elective courses will improve learning outcomes for students in Brampton and across the Peel region? The question is to the Premier. Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much. You know, again, it's another day and another opportunity to talk about how we need to get this province back on track. And the fact of the matter is we're spending $36 million a day in interest That's right. on the debt and deficit and that we inherited from a failed Liberal government. And so we all have to do our part. And when I'm consulting across this province, I'm hearing from teachers, look to the boards. Look to the boards to see what they can do to find some savings. Because really, we're standing with teachers, we're standing with students, we're standing with parents when we say, school boards, stop the fear-mongering. Third, uh, pardon me, opposition party, stop the fear mongering. Third. Because opposition the fact of the matter is, you know what? They are able Response. to look within and find the appropriate savings, and let's focus on what matters most and protect what matters most. That's the learning environment in the classroom. School boards have. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, students across the Peel region have spoken out about the cuts uh, to their education. Whether it's cancelling courses, cutting jobs, or increasing class sizes, people across this province are concerned. Concerned about the cancelled elective courses that the Peel District School Board says, and I quote, for certain students, uh, these types of courses are key to their ongoing engagement in school, and they are disciplines that inspire and motivate learners. The elimination or reduction of these courses, Mr. Speaker, will decrease student engagement, which will, is directly linked to student achievement, credit acquisition, and ultimately these students' ability to graduate. So I'll ask again, why is this Premier making it so hard for students in this province to complete the courses they need to graduate and earn their high school diploma? 
What we just heard from the member opposite is absolutely a positive proof point why we need to have a board governance review. Yeah, yeah. That nonsense that's coming from that board is absolutely mean-spirited. They're Position purposely creating anxiety for students and parents and teachers alike. Yeah. And we look Opposition forward to, to making sure that school boards pull up their socks because they can look from, to from within to find savings to make sure we have the best learning. The Leader of the Opposition has to come to order. The Opposition Caucus has to come to order so as to allow the Minister of Education to respond. Minister? Again, I am very, very pointed when I say it's not an accident that people across this province have asked us to do a board governance review because they are sick and tired of the mismanagement at the board level and absolutely the rhetoric that comes from that board Opposition, is unacceptable because we need to make sure Spons. our school boards are a responsible administration and they can look within to find savings as opposed to fear-mongering with students and teachers. Thank you. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Obio came to Queen's Park this week to talk about the importance of church, the way in which it creates jobs. No points of order during question period. Oh. I've been advised that the member for Guelph has, has asked a question in this round and is not eligible to ask a question at this time. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Erin Mills. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Children, yeah. Community and Social Services. <laughs> Our government's plan for social assistance is about a more effective sustainable approach to helping people prepare to return to work and achieve better outcomes. Speaker, the minister had often said that the best social safety net is a com compassionate society, and the best social program in the province of Ontario is a job. S Speaker, our government has created 170,000 new jobs since June 2018. Can the minister outline how our government's social assistance reforms will allow the province most vulnerable to lift themselves out of the poverty? Minister of Children, Community Thanks and Social Services. I think that was a very important question, and I'm glad to, to be able to answer it. As we all know, uh, social assistance in the province of Ontario costs Ontario uh, about $10 million. We have about a million people that are on social assistance, yet still one in seven people live or are trapped in a cycle of poverty. We need to change that. Over the past 15 years, the number of Ontarians forced to go on social assistance has skyrocketed, but skyrocketed by a whopping 55 per cent. Yet at the same time, we know we have 200,000 jobs that remain unfilled in the province of Ontario. And in the last several months after taking office, Premier Ford and our finance minister and our team have been able to grow the economy by another 170,000 jobs, which we're very proud of. We believe there are a number of hundreds of thousands of people on social assistance who are employable, who uh, deserve the dignity and respect of a job. And that's why we're creating wraparound supports with the Ministry of Response. Training Colleges and Universities so that we can train people for the jobs that are out there so that they can actually have a paycheck from a company and they can ensure that they are looking after themselves and their family. We believe the best social Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Through you, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the minister for the work she's doing to support the province most vulnerable. Almost one million Ontarians are on some form of social assistance. Under the previous Liberal government, these individuals were met with a system of disjointed and patchwork supports that trapped our neighbours in a cycle of poverty that is difficult to skip. I was disappointed to learn that, as a result, only 1% of people on social assistance re-enter the workforce in a given month. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government's social assistance reforms will help Ontario most vulnerable get themselves back a path towards self-service. 
Minister to reply. It's important that we have strong families, safer streets, and self-reliance in the province of Ontario, and that is what we aim to do in the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. That's why we're working with the other ministries in the humanities so that we can best approach the wraparound supports that are needed by those who are on social assistance so they can get back into the workforce, they can get the mental health support that they need, that they can get the child care that they, they uh, desperately have, uh, require, and to ensure that they don't pay as much tax, which is why we brought in the lift tax credit. This is a government that's doing things differently. We're working together. We're leveraging the whole of government approach, which is something I'm quite proud of. And as I mentioned in the, in the uh, beginning of the, of the question, we're working with the Ministry of Changing Colleges and Universities to get people employment ready so they can get back into the workforce and that they can have the dignity and respect of a job and they can contribute to our great and wonderful society here in the province of Ontario. But, Speaker, Spons. as I continue this, uh, as we continue the reforms in social assistance, I must say that we want to continue to protect what matters most. And and what matters most is a compassionate society in the province of Ontario, which is what we're continuing to build. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last Friday, we got word in the region of Waterloo that their public health unit was to be merged with Peel and Halton regions, as well as Wellington and Dufferin and Guelph. This new public health unit will serve nearly three million people with very different needs over a large geographic area. Couple this with millions of dollars in cuts, people and medical officers are justifiably worried. Why? Because there will be less money to serve more people, and there is no evidence to suggest that the government understands the consequences of their cuts and of this move. Mr. Speaker, why is this government not thinking before they act? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you very much, Speaker. We are modernizing our public health system so that it's going to be able to respond to the needs of Ontarians now and into the future. The document that the member was referring to is a a consultation document. No boundaries have been decided upon yet. That is subject to consultations with the local health units as well as with the municipalities, just for purposes of discussion to understand what the appropriate boundaries should be. So there's nothing carved in stone as yet, and I think that that will come become clear as we have those discussions and as we speak with municipalities and the public health units. So there's no need to push the panic button. Supplementary question. The Peterborough medical officer, the Peterborough medical officer, says that there was no consultation about the proposed boundaries of the new public health agencies, and they said we have not even been given any rational for why the regions look the way they do. Mr. Speaker, public health works because it prevents the spread of disease and other negative health outcomes. For every one dollar spent on immunizations, there are forty-five dollars worth of savings to the health care system. These are smart investments in the health care system, and at a time when hospitals are overcrowded. We have a record number of people dying from opioid overdoses, and measles cases have been reported in Toronto. These public health cuts are, frankly, irresponsible. Public health officers and medical experts are telling the government this. Why are you not listening? Remind the members to make their comments through the chair and recognize the minister again to reply. Thank you. Thank you. Consultations are happening through technical tables that have been established. There will be consultation with the local health units. There will yeah, be consultation, consultation with the municipal consultation. municipalities about the appropriate boundaries to make sure that the needs of Ontarians are going to be met. And I am confident that with the monies that the local health units and the broader, bigger health units as they're established are going to receive, they will be able to meet the public health needs of their communities, making sure that people receive the vaccinations that they need, Mackey, making sure Okay. that the children's and, uh, and other breakfast and lunch programs are continued, making sure that the need, people with special needs needs are being met. All of those things can and will be accomplished if people set their minds to the priorities of what public health units are set up for. We were establishing financial order. stewards of public funds provincially. We take that seriously, and we know Spons. that the public health units will do the same to make sure that those priorities are covered. The next question, the member for King Vaughan. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Solicitor General. 
Parliamentarians of all political stripes have a duty to stand up in the defence of tolerance, inclusion and freedom. Disturbingly, in 2019, in this pluralistic liberal democracy, we are seeing a troubling escalation of hate crimes targeting people of all faiths, including against Jews in this country. Anti-Semitic acts perpetrate to divide, to intimidate and to inflict violence. Speaker, it is incumbent on all members of this legislature to denounce this hate and to name it and to shame it. In communities like my own in Vaughan and across this province and the globe, we have seen the highest number of hate crimes ever recorded targeting Jew our Jewish neighbours. And most recently, a more perverse new anti-Semitism is emerging that demonizes Israel and her citizens, the homeland of the Jewish people. To, to the Solicitor General, will you commit to an unrelenting campaign, a whole-of-government effort to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hate in communities across this province? Question is to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from King Vaughan for raising this important issue today. You know, it deserves the attention of every single member, as he mentioned. I want to start by stating that our government has absolutely zero tolerance for hate, racism, discrimination, or violence in all its forms. This is not a partisan issue, Speaker, and I know that members and colleagues from both sides will at every opportunity, join me in denouncing racial discrimination. Let me be clear. Ontario is one of the safest and most accepting jurisdictions in the entire world to be a minority. But sadly, hate persists on the margins, promoted by a destru destructive view who seem, seek to sow divisions within our communities. We know racism in its many forms is a threat here in Ontario. Some people in Ontario, including in the Black, Indigenous, Jewish and Muslim communities, deal with systemic racism and bias on a regular basis. Response. As Solicitor General and Minister responsible for the Anti-Racism Directorate, I can firmly say we won't stand idle and allow these acts to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Speaker, back to the minister. Learned members of this House will take note of Sir Winston Churchill's comments, who said, and I quote, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Every member of this House has a moral duty to stand up against acts of violence and racism targeting minority faith communities in this country. We live in a time when anti-Semitism is on the rise across the globe, from Toronto to Paris to Buenos Aires. Here at home, we expect all levels of government to denounce violence and division within the province. With the proliferation of hatred targeting Jews around the world now more than ever, it is incumbent on our federal government to advance a principled foreign policy uh, that promotes the values of freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Speaker, to the Solicitor General, can you outline the steps this government is taking to keep people safe, to stand up for victims, and to get tough on those who target Canadians simply because of their faith? The Solicitor General. Taking a leadership role on these important issues. Government also has a leading role to play in eliminating anti Semitism in all forms of hate across our province. And we're working with our partners and the people of Ontario to address these threats to the safety of our communities and everyone who calls Ontario home. As a government, we've promised to give our police the tools, resources, and support they need to do their job. That includes fighting hate crime. But building a more inclusive society doesn't just fall to government. It is on us, as citizens, to learn about hatred in all of its forms, to learn about history so that it doesn't repeat itself, to recognize our own biases. Most importantly, it's up to each and every one of us to call out racism and hatred when we witness it. That takes courage to do sometimes, Speaker, but we absolutely must do it. Together, we can ensure the rights and freedoms of everyone in Ontario is respected, and we can work together to combat the threat of racial discrimination in the places that we work, that we go to school, and the communities where we live for the future of our children. Thank you. Well said. Thank you very much. The next question, the member from London, Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Earlier this month, the government told Middlesex London Paramedic Services that their budget would be frozen for this year. This week, Middlesex London Paramedic Services released their projections on what that funding freeze will mean to paramedic services in, London, in the London area, and it's not good. They are projecting a 750,000 hole in their budget, which will be made up by possibly increases to Londoners' tax bill, property tax bill, so that services don't need to be cut. Why is the Premier forcing London to contemplate raising property taxes so they can properly fund life-saving paramedic services? The question is for the Premier. 
Minister of Health. Refer to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Thank you. Paramedic services are extremely important, both in terms of their traditional role and some un some less traditional roles that they are fulfilling. But we are consistently sticking with a stable funding for paramedics to make sure that they can continue to do the work that they're doing. But we also want to make sure that we can upgrade their technology so that they can have faster access dispatch and sending people out so that by the time the paramedics arrive on the scene, they understand what the specific circumstances that they need to deal with, and they can provide those life-saving services faster because time is of the essence. As you know, we want to make sure that people can get the treatment they need, uh, whether en route to hospital or maybe even being directly provided by paramedics. So we support them. We we appreciate the great work that we're doing, and we are supplying them with stable funding. Supplementary question. Speaker, according to the warden of Middlesex County, the paramedic services budget is, quote, the lowest possible it can be. With the cuts now, we can only look at reopening the budget, but realistically, there isn't much to shave off, end quote. The government's funding freeze will put the people of London, Middlesex County at risk. When will people have a medical emergency call when they have a, when people have a medical emergency they call 911 and they know that their emergency medical services will be there to help save their lives why is the premier freezing funding that paramedic services need to save lives once again minister of health and long term care Thank you, Speaker. Well, municipalities received a 5.8 per cent increase in ambulance service funding in 2017 and a 5.3 per cent increase in funding with 2018. Our government is providing stable funding this year to provide the paramedics and the services they provide with the, uh, the, the revenue that they need. Again, I need to uh, remind the member that we inherited a $15 billion deficit, the largest sub-sovereign debt in the world. We have to balance that against the needs of people to provide people with the quality education and health services that they need. I am confident with the, in, with the increases they've had over the past years and with the stable funding that they're receiving this year, our paramedics will be able to continue to do the great work that they do in communities across Ontario. Next question, the member from Mississauga East Cookston. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, most of us in this house have likely rented at least once in their lifetime. For some, it was when you left your parents' home for the first time. For others, it was when moving to a new city, and some could be renting now. However, Mr. Speaker, it is becoming increasingly difficult to find rentals in Mississauga and across Ontario. There are record low vacancy rates, and it is clear that there are not enough homes for the people of Ontario, which in turn divide, drives up costs. When rent control was expanded in 2017, there were reports of planned purpose-built rental units being cancelled. That is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. Can the minister please inform the House of what actions our government has taken to help make rentals more affordable and accessible across Ontario? Great question. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville for that uh, great question and also for his advocacy on the housing file in his riding. Speaker, uh, as I've said, yes, you should give him a hand. Speaker, as I've said many times in this House, uh, we have a supply problem, and as the member notes, uh, we've had we were seeing um, record uh, vacancy shortages in many communities across Ontario. We're putting forward a number of me measures to increase the housing supply in Ontario, especially purpose-built rentals that our province uh, needs so desperately. Last fall, as part of our fall economic statement, we exempted new rental units from rent controls while protecting existing tenants. This exemption creates a positive investment environment, uh, and again, we hope it will spur on new purpose-built rentals. Response. Throughout this change and many others, and I'll get to some of those other changes in our supplementary, uh, we are providing more homes and more choice, a uh, very important issue to bring forward in this, in this house. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that great answer. Speaker, in my riding of Mississauga East Cooksville, people from all walks of life are struggling to find a home or rental unit. In Ontario, more than half of renters find the average rent for a two-bedroom to be too much for their budget. That is, 
if they could find a quality rental in the first place. This means rental units for young adults leaving home for or for seniors looking to downsize are struggling to move into the next stage of their life. Thankfully, our government wants to put affordable home ownership in reach of more Ontario families and provide more people with the opportunity to live closer to where they work. Mr. Speaker, can the minister further ex expand on what our government is doing to incentivize the building of more rental units across all of Ontario? Great supplement. Minister to reply. Thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. And again, I want to thank uh, the honourable member for uh, that question and those great points. Uh, speaker, to encourage uh, the building of more rentals, our government is proposing uh, to allow development charges for rental housing to be paid over a five-year period instead of upfront. Deferring those development charges until the units are occupied would, again, make it more attractive for rental units to be built. We are also exempting uh, second units from development charges to, again, encourage the development of more secondary units. These are things, Speaker, like basement apartments and laneway units. Further, Speaker, we're working with Tribunals Ontario to fill the gaps and increase resources at the Landlord-Tenant Board. We're, we're encouraging the building of affordable housing and rental units around major transit station areas so Ontarians Great can idea. get to work and home a lot quicker. Speaker, these proposed changes, we believe, Spons. will provide more homes and more choice. And I want to thank again the honourable member for that wonderful question. Question, the member for My question is for the Minister of Education. As a result of the Premier's cuts to our education system, French immersion programs throughout the province are at risk. The TDSB says that there will be a, re a reduction, a significant reduction in the budget for French immersion programs. Students in Hamilton fear that they won't be able to take French immersion classes this fall as a result of the increase in class size. And the Upper Grand School Board has indicated that smaller class sizes and specialized courses such as French immersion could become un and it could no longer be possible. Why, Madam Minister, are you currently cutting French immersion programs in this province? Speaker, let me be perfectly clear. We're investing in education across this province, both English and French. French immersion is very important. I've had wonderful meetings with our good working partners, and we're going to make sure that we are honouring the, the expectations and the, the necessities that go along with ensuring that we're a bilingual province. And the fact of the matter is, school boards are doing nothing but fear-mongering. The member opposite is perpetuating it, and I can't wait for September to come along when teachers are in place, courses are in place, and the fact of the matter is we're focusing in on student achievement, and no matter what the members opposite say, we're investing, come to order. as the Premier said Minister earlier this morning, $700 million in education, and we're going to get it back on track here, here. no matter what the message is that member opposite. Thank you. Supplementary question. Madam, Madam Minister, you're accusing school boards, but it's your cuts that are at the centre of what people are afraid of in this province. No one's trying to scare anyone. It's your cuts that are frightening. Your cuts mean that decisions are made, have been made to reduce French immersion programs. And why? As a result of the cuts of your ministry on school boards. So therefore, I ask you the question again. Why are you putting French immersion programs at risk in this province? Well, Speaker, again, you know what? It's one order. Opposition, come to order. Allow the minister to reply. Minister, I, I just am finding 
the, the claims coming from the party opposite to be absolutely amusing at this stage of the game. Day in and day out, this party is doing nothing but making a fool out of themselves, because when this fall comes around, we are going to have absolute evidence that they were doing nothing but fear-mongering. You know, we're investing in education like no other government has. We are investing in financial literacy. We're investing in math. We're investing in making sure that there are good learning environments for Francophone students. And we're getting education back on track. They can say the sky is falling. They can push all the panic buttons they want. But the reality is we're going to be Thank you. Thank you. The next question, member for Simcoe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Speaker, the skilled trades are a critical aspect of our economy, and yet many jobs in the trades continue to go unfilled. I have heard from employers in my riding who are frustrated with the red tape and stifling regulation that the previous skilled trades framework created and the lack of action by the previous government to make life easier for tradespeople in Ontario. That's why I was so pleased to see that our government introduced a plan in Budget 2019 to modernize the skilled trades in Ontario. Can the minister tell us about how our government's modernization of the skilled trades will help make Ontario open for business and open for jobs? Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. And thank you to the member from uh, Simcoe North for her great work and for the question. Speaker, unlike the NDP, our government is committed to making Ontario open for business and open for jobs yeah. by reducing the burden right. on skilled workers. Right. And in the fall, the Making Ontario Open for Business Act was passed and immediately reduced journey person to apprenticeship ratios to a standard one-to-one. -one. Budget 2019, we introduced the Modernizing the Skilled Trades and Apprenticeship Act, which, if passed, will create a flexible system for the skilled trades in Ontario. It will reduce red tape for employers and apprentices, streamline service delivery, and help promote the tremendous career opportunities in the skilled trades. This new framework Spons. will allow our workforce to respond to the demands of the job market ensuring that Ontario is open for business and open for jobs. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for your answer. Speaker, it's great to hear that we are taking decisive action to address the failing skilled trades framework left behind by the previous Liberal government. Here, here. It's clear our government is listening to employers, and it's clear that our plan will reduce red tape, improve access to the skilled trades, and make Ontario open for business. I know our government recognizes the urgent need to fill the skills gap and open up well-paying, rewarding career pathways for our young people. Can the minister tell us more about our plan to the skill, for the skilled trades is already helping to create good jobs in Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. Speaker, our government has heard loud and clear from employers that our plan is working. During committee hearings for Bill 100, Stephen Hamilton of the Ontario Home Builders Association highlighted several association members that have been active in hiring apprentices since our change to one-to-one -one ratios. Great, great news. Quote, Jamie Adam from Pioneer Craftsman in Waterloo Region has already hired an additional three carpentry apprentices. Gary Birch from Halliburton County has hired an additional two apprentices. And Peter Madsen from CCR Building and Remodeling in London has hired six additional wow. carpentry apprentices. Response. Speaker, these are just a few examples of the jobs that have been created as a direct result of our actions. A sign Thank you. Next question, member for York Southwest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Toronto Public Health provides essential health services to the people of Toronto. But in my riding of York Southwest alone, there are 102 programs at risk of being defunded because of the government's cuts to public health. 
like school breakfast programs that service thousands of students in my community, or dental care for senior programs. Stop the clock. <laughs> Minister of Children, Community and Social Services has to come to order. Once again, start the clock and then go back to the member. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Toronto Public Health provides essential, service, essential health services to the people of Toronto. But in my riding of York Southwestern alone, there are 102 programs at risk of being defunded because of the government's cuts to public health, like school breakfast programs that serve thousands of students in my community, or dental care for senior programs that help keep their smiles bright. Why is this government turning its back? on the people of Ontario, their health and their well-being. Right on. Right. Questions to the Premier? Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I can certainly agree with the member. Public health is extremely important, and we have committed to provide the City of Toronto with $114 million for public health this year, which will enable them to provide those vital services like vaccinations. The breakfast programs will continue. They are also partially funded through the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. We will also be funding the programs and services necessary to support children with special needs. But the if the uh, Toronto Board of Health concentrates on those issues, they will be able to provide those vital services. But what has been floated lately is instead of doing the hard work and getting down to looking through line by line by line at everything that they do, as we had to do, instead the, the automatic answer is let's raise taxes. That's not the answer. Response. What the City of Toronto needs to do is take a look, do the hard work and figure out what changes need to be made to make sure they can constantly Thank you. Supplementary question. Again, uh, my question is to the Premier. We must learn from our past to make sure that history does not repeat itself. Public health units were identified as one of the ways to ensure tragedies such as Wakatund or the Toronto SARS outbreak never happens again. Mm. Investment in our public health system is vital to keeping Ontario strong and healthy, but cutting public health funding and putting over 100 health programs at risk in York Southwestern, in my community alone, would be damaging to the long-term health of our community. Will this government do the right thing and commit to reversing cuts made to public health across this province? Minister to reply. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I would say to the member, the uh, Ministry of Health is committed to spending and pro providing the City of Toronto with $114 million for public health for this year. That is more than an adequate amount of money for them to be able to provide the necessary programs and services. But I would suggest that what the city should be doing is taking a look line by line through all of the public health services they provide to make sure that they are providing the services that matter most to people. And what I have certainly heard from people is they care about vaccinations, they care about those breakfast programs, they care about supporting people with special needs. We've also invested $90 million for a, a dental program for low-income seniors. We are making the investments in services that matter most, and I am sure that if the City of Toronto gets down and goes through line by line of all those programs and services, they will find that there is more than enough money to provide the services that people care about, Response. the essential public services that matter most to keep people safe and healthy in the City of Toronto. That concludes our question period for today. The member for Sudbury, first of all, has informed me he has a point of order. Thanks, Speaker. I'd like to rise on a point of order to correct my record. Uh, this morning, I was estimating that 300 Ontarians died from opioid overdoses in six months. The correct number is actually much higher. It was 629 who had died from opiate overdoses in the first six months of 2018, from January to June. Thank you, Speaker. Shame. Member for Brantford Brant on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to take a moment and introduce my daughter to the House visiting today. Um, she's my oldest. Uh, she's in second year at uh, Mohawk in graphic design. I'm extremely proud of her, but she'll always be my little girl. Uh, thank you, uh, Lena, for visiting us today. I'm going to ask our pages to assemble at this time.
because it's now time for us to acknowledge this great group of legislative pages. Our pages are hardworking, trustworthy, and smart. They are indispensable to all that goes on in this chamber, and we are indeed fortunate to have all of them here. Our pages will now go home, having made new friends with a better understanding of parliamentary democracy and memories that will last them a lifetime. And in the coming years, each of them will continue their studies and in time contribute to their communities, their province, and their country in important ways. And who knows, maybe some of them will take their seats in the House as members or as staff here. We wish all of you well. I would like to ask all members to now please join me in showing our appreciation of this great group of Thank you very much. They deserve a raise, I think. <laughs> we have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 107, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act and various other statutes in respect of transportation-related matters. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
can ask the members to please take their seats. On May the 8th, 2019, Mr. Yurick moved second reading of Bill 107. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethenfalls. Mr. Bethenfalls. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parsa. Mr. Parsa. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Trantafilopoulos. Ms. Trantafilopoulos. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carhalios. Mrs. Carhalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Anon. Mr. Anon. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Smith Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Smith Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanigaslan. Mr. Tanigaslan. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Madame Jalina. Madame Jalina. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Carpoche. Mr. Mr. Manta. Mr. Manta. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Styles. Mr. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. French. Mrs. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton. Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Mr. Creek. Mr. Singh, Brampton East. Mr. Singh, Brampton East. Miss Andrews. Miss Andrews. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Mr. Morrison. Mr. Morrison. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Miss Hunt. Miss Monty Farrell. Miss Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. The ayes are 64, the nays are 37. The ayes being 64 and the nays being 37, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill gives you a motion to approach the law. Pursuant to the order of the House dated May 15, 2019, the bill stands referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. Leader of the Opposition has a point of order. A speaker, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, we had in the gallery, uh, in fact, in the media gallery, Carrie Lee Crawford from G987, who is probably here because this afternoon there'll be a tribute to his uh, former boss, the late Fitzroy Gordon, and I thought it was important to acknowledge he was here. Thank you very much. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.